Can I ask a question? No. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, I was doing Chrome 2 on the Chrome 2.2, and uh, a few of them I don't understand how the answer that we got is correct. So I was just looking at the 2.2 homeworks. They were talking about limit values versus like function values on some of the early problems. Okay. You want me to show you the problem? Or? Uh, I want you to ask in the discussion section. So we're going to do write limit. So we have something very similar happening. You want to think about the interval that's at the top of the screen right here. I'll zoom in on it. We're going to approach, instead of on the side we crossed out, we're going to approach on the other side. So we're going to approach, no. Yeah, we're approaching on the side we crossed out. So we're going to approach this side this time. So our definition of a limit is really similar. It's going to start out any epsilon greater than 0. There exists a delta greater than zero such that, and feel free to use either the symbols I showed you or the words. What you don't want to do is try to force yourself to use the symbols if they're hard to remember which is which. So just use the words when in doubt if the symbols are a little tricky. So here's the written out any epsilon. There exists a delta such that. Let's skip the first inequality. The second inequality looks exactly the same. So now we'll worry about the first inequality. So approaching on the right side. So we're going to have x approaching a from the right. So that means a is less than x. Let's see, how did we do? And we have our interval right here where we're going to go delta basically delta both those. Now my picture's not good. So this is a plus delta. There we go. X is supposed to live in between a and a plus delta. So a is less than x less than a plus delta. And we're doing the same thing we did before except we're crossing out the right side of this interval. So the number line keeps going, but we're going to forget about everything over on the left side. So we're going to take our inequality and subtract delta, no, subtract a, that's what we're going to do. So there's our inequality. Zero is less than x minus a is less than delta. So it's exactly the same except there's just no absolute value around the x minus a anymore. So that is right limit. And I won't ask you the definition of one side limit. So you don't need to worry about the definition of one side limit. I don't think I put it in a box. Let's see. Nope, didn't put left limit in a box either. That was not coincidental. That was on purpose. So you don't need to, I don't want you to memorize these one side limits. You need to know what they are, but you don't need the, you don't need to memorize the definition. So theorem, this is theorem six in your book. A function uh, 
f of x has a, a limit at x equals a exactly when both one sided limits exist. So we'll write exactly when left limit and right limit exist and agree at x equals a. So your limit, you have the regular limit exactly when your two-sided limits have the same value. So that's what theorem 6 says. So if we write it out a little bit uh, more mathematically and less, uh, using less language, we can write lim x approaches a f of x equals l exactly when so here is where we use the double double arrow so this means what's on the left if you have what's on the left then you get what's on the right and if you have what's on the right you get what's on the left so it means they're exactly the same So just reading this off, it says the limit is L exactly when the left limit is L and the right limit is also L. So if your two limits, your two one-sided limits agree, that means your regular limit exists. So any questions about this theorem? You can use this, a lot of your 2-2 homeworks ask about one-sided limits and this will be useful there. So we'll do an example, and this will be similar to quite a few homeworks. So I'm going to draw a graph. So I'm going to cheat and give myself graph paper. So our function, we need two y values, zero and 0, 1, and 2, and 1, 2, and 3 for x values. So the filled in points are the actual values at 0, 1, and 2, x equals 0, x equals 1, x equals 2. And then the empty circles at 1, 2, and 3 are not the function values. So those are the removed points right there. And this is the graph of y equals f of x. And we want to find What is the value of f at 1? The limb as x approaches 1 on the left side or the negative side of f of x. So these are all about the x value 1. So do your best to answer these off the graph. You should be getting three numbers. Some of them may be the same, but each of these should exist, and you should be getting some number for each of these three. All right, first one, what is f of 1? Four. 
Is it zero, one, or two? All right, so we're looking at x value one, and we're looking for the actual at x equals one, not close to one, but at x equals one, what y value do we have? One, right up there at that point right there. So when you actually plug in one, not close to one, but when you plug in one, your output is one. That's the dot right there. All right, left limit as x approaches one on the left side. So we can see that we are approaching zero going down the curve there. So we get zero for left limit, and now we'll do right limit. What happens when we approach one from the right side? We approach the y value of one right there. Yep, negative land or positive land. Think about it like that. So negative is left, which is that way. And that, that little minus sign, I just think that's negative land over there. Even if you're at a, a really large value, like a million, negative land just refers to what direction the negatives are from. So if you have a real number line, it would be reasonable to say minus plus. So if you see minus, that means left, and if you see plus, that means from right. So if you got A right here, X approaches A with a minus sign would mean we're approaching that way. Now the confusing part, one of the confusing parts, if I write X approaches A plus, this actual arrow that I drew is actually going the wrong direction. Because what that means, x is approaching a from the right side. What I mean is, it would probably make more sense to write it like that, but we don't. So there's the black one's a negative side, the blue one's a positive side. All right, so what can we say from that theorem we just wrote down about lim? x approaches 1, f of x. So do the one side of limits agree? Is 0 equal to 1? Nope. So the two limits disagree. So what that means about our actual limit, so that's exactly right, it does not exist. So only if they agree could we say our limit exists. So our uh, two one side limits disagree, so this limit overall does not exist. And we're gonna do the same exact thing for two. So I wanna know what is f of two? Lim x approaches two from the negative side. And lim x approaches two from the positive side. And then after you get that, use the theorem and look at just x approaches 2 on both sides. And what do you get? So I'll scroll up for the graph. So we're approaching 2. So easy question, what, if you take two and F it, what actual value do you get when you plug two in? Not approaching, but when you plug two in, you get one. So no limits, just plug in the value two. You're using this point, which has a Y value of one. Question? Uh, yeah, the, so the points that have a circle, they, those don't count? Uh, they, tell you what's happening close to there, but not, so you can say right there, that, that doesn't actually include the x value two. So we cut out just when x equals two, that single point has been removed, and it's where that dot is, which is at one. Does that make sense? So 
So it's like the same down the line, it's going up there, and then all of a sudden at that point, there's nothing there. But then there's a point down below. Yeah, it's just one point removed. That's all. Uh, if I drew it, the problem is you can't actually draw it to scale because if you actually remove a point, you won't see it out of there because there's an infinite number of points in there. So you won't notice a point missing. It would be smaller than, way smaller than one pixel. So you wouldn't actually be able to see it. Um, you can see right here, I mean, I drew this so big that you could fit quite a few points inside right there. But you can't draw it so small that you couldn't draw another point inside. So it's an exaggeration of how much is removed, basically. All right, so we said two. Or at two, we get one. What about the limits you approach to? So when you approach two, you're not equal to two. So it, that's not relevant anymore. It's on the graph, but it's not relevant to the limit. So what do we approach on the left? So on the left, we're going to approach y value of 2. On the right, definitely 2, 2 the whole time. So left is 2 and right is 2. So theorem says, get 2 on the left, 2 on the right, and the limit is 2. So when they agree, it means your regular limit is also the same. So you get 2. So we get the first two to agree, and that tells you your limit is 2. However, we can also look and see, well, the limit is 2, but the function value is not 2. So there is basically a hole in the graph, is what that tells you. Yep. Okay, so the f of 1 equals 1, and then the f of 2 equals 1. Why are they different from the limit equaling, or well, limit? Like, okay, so the f of 2 equals 1. Why is the limit of 2, like approaching 2, 2? Why wouldn't it be 1 also? So the limit doesn't, isn't concerned with uh, when x equals 2. So the point I just erased has nothing to do with the limit as x approaches 2. Okay, so when it says f of and then a number, we're only looking at the x value? Yeah, you're looking at the x value, not close to it. Oh. So that point right there is not important in the limit. Okay. It's only important in the value. What's important in the limit is right up here getting close to that removed point on the graph, basically. So you're approaching the x value of 2, and so you're on that curve on either side. So then when like, f of equals a number, the x value will always be a closed circle? Either a closed circle, or, or I could plug in uh, 1, 1 1.5 right here. And I might ask you something about 1. It's really boring at, at 1.5, because your limit on both sides is going to match the value. Oh. So most points in the graph are not very exciting. So generally, we'll ask about uh, you know, values like 1 or 2 and what's happening near there. And our next theorem is going to be uh, more geometrical. So if you measure theta and radians, sine theta over theta equals 1. And 
when theta approaches zero, cos theta minus one over theta equals zero. So these are two special limits. And they're both, they both require the thetas and radians. But theta is always going to be in radians in this class. So I'm not going to put that inside the box. So we had some inequalities before, and they were I think this was our inequality from before, right here. We looked very carefully at the circle about measuring an arc length versus the little bit of x or a little bit of y that you went, and the arc was always going to be longer than the, the sign, in this case, the amount of y that you traveled. So really fast review of that. The vertical measurement is sine, and the along the circle is theta. So we said the curved path is longer than the straight path to get there. So we're not going to go through all that again. What we are going to do is take some limits, but first I want to divide uh, both sides of our inequality by theta. So why would this be a very dangerous move to multiply by 1 over theta? Remember, we're going to take a limit as theta approaches 0, which also means theta is not 0. So I don't have to worry about dividing by 0. But what do I need to worry about if I make this move? So if theta is positive or if theta is negative? What happens if theta is negative and I multiply? Changing the inequalities around. So all your inequalities are going to flip around. Pac-Man turns around. Or however you think of the inequalities. So there's a few ways to fix it. One of the ways, well, we'll just take an absolute value of theta. And then it's definitely not uh, going to be negative anymore. So I won't have to worry about flipping my inequality around. So we'll multiply by 1 over absolute value theta. So what theorem should I apply now? Theorem seven. No, I'm trying to prove theorem 7. What theorem had limits in it and had a small, medium, a large function? Sandwich, Sandwich theorem or the squeeze theorem? So let's take a limit of the outer functions, the big and the small, and let's see what we get. And we're using thetas, not x's. So theta approaches 0. Theta approaches 0, negative 1. And lim theta approaches 0, a positive 1. So what's the limit of negative 1 as theta approaches 0? constant function. What is the limit of negative 1 as theta approaches anything? Negative 1. It's a constant limit. It's always negative 1. No matter what was sitting underneath the limit, wouldn't affect it. It's always going to approach negative 1. All right, what about limit of positive 1? As theta approaches anything, positive 1. So we got the two outsides. Approach negative 1, approach positive 1. So we now can conclude 
limit theta approaches zero, sine theta over theta. This doesn't really narrow it down too much though. It says it's somewhere between negative one and one. There's a lot of numbers between negative one and one, so this doesn't narrow it down whatsoever. Well, at least we know it's not bigger than one. All right, so we need to, unfortunately, get a much better lower bound than negative one. So we think it's positive one, but let's try to get a much better bound than negative one. So we're gonna redo what we just did, except I'm gonna very carefully multiply by one over theta. Uh, somewhere I need to write, oh, so this is by the sandwich theorem. All right, so let's start over. And let's get out a graph paper. So we have this inequality. There's going to be, uh, if, th if theta is negative, so I do want to multiply by 1 over theta, but now I have to decide if theta is negative, the inequalities will flip one way. If theta is positive, the inequalities will flip the other way. Well, I should, if, if it's positive, they won't flip at all. So there's two possibilities. We'll do theta negative here, and we'll do theta positive over here. So we'll go negative on the left, positive on the right. So if theta is less than zero, we're gonna have negative absolute value theta over theta greater than or equal to sine theta over theta greater than or equal to absolute value theta over theta. So all I did was distributed the one over theta and flipped the inequalities. So I didn't really do that much. Just divide everything by theta and flipped inequalities. What in the heck is absolute value of theta over theta? Well, let's deal with absolute value theta. If theta is less than zero, what does that mean about absolute value theta? Does that mean absolute value theta equals regular theta? If theta is negative, it means absolute value is negative theta. So if theta is already negative, let's say it's negative five, how do you make negative five positive? You can put another negative sign in front of it. So absolute value of a negative is equal to negative itself. You can see this happen like this right here. That's all we're doing. So if what's inside is negative, you just throw another negative sign in front of it and make it positive. So this is the part I wanted to keep together. Right there. So if x is less than zero, absolute value x is gonna be negative x. Now if you're looking at negative x and thinking, ah, oh, that's definitely positive, well, you're assuming that regular x is already, or if you look at negative x and think that's definitely negative, what are you assuming about x? It is positive. That's positive, which is exactly the opposite of what's the case. So don't assume a quantity is positive just because you want to. So don't assume x is positive. So if x is negative, that means negative x is actually positive. So that's the identity we're using right there.
If you know x is negative, negative x is positive. Doesn't make a lot of sense when you say it, but. So any questions on that idea right there? That's all we're doing over here. Somewhere, so absolute value of theta is negative theta. So I'm gonna make that substitution. So we got negative theta. Oops. So. so I'm just taking out theta, absolute value theta, replacing it by negative theta. Now I can cancel very nicely. So on the left side, we have negative, negative theta over theta, which is positive one. So I'm going to put the small on the left and the big on the right. looking at my notes. We may have to do this with geometry instead of the sandwich theorem. So if I apply sandwich theorem here, I'm going to get sine theta over theta is less than 1. And greater than negative 1. But I still won't, I won't have a good lower bound on the left side. So I'm not sure how to get the lower bound on this at the moment. So let's just go with I told you so. And that's why it's true. Uh, we should be able to prove the second one. All right, so you have to take my word on the first one being true. It's proved in your book. And we'll go and show the second one is true, if we know the first one is true. Assume the first one is true, which is what algebra would be a reasonable thing to do here? What would be a reasonable thing to multiply by? I want to prove this equals one. No, zero, we said. If you're proving identities, what would be a good thing to multiply by? You can say the C word. Uh, conjugate. conjugate. So conjugate of the only thing we can conjugate, which is cos theta minus 1. So we're going to go cos theta plus 1. And you have to be fair, so you got to multiply by 1 or else you're going to change the whole quantity. All right, why in the world are we doing this? Hopefully that will become more clear. So foiling the top, you get to cancel your outside inside, so you just have first squared minus second squared. And on the non-conjugate part, I recommend don't distribute. What is cos squared minus 1? Sine, uh, negative sine. Is 
So it's either a positive or negative sign. Negative. I think it's positive sign. Negative sign? Hold on. Oh man. Co squared plus sine squared equals one. Minus one. All right, negative sine squared. And I'm going to rearrange this fraction. And if you have trouble rearranging, seeing how this, I rearranged this fraction, all I did, I just took a squared over bc, and I wrote it as a over b times a over c, right there. So I just split up the, rearranged the fraction. And hopefully you did enough trick identities that you're okay with trigonometry and some algebra. So why in the world would I do this? Well, we know the limit of sine theta over theta, and that's why I separated that part out. So we assumed over here that we knew sine theta over theta limit was equal to one, and now I'm going to uh, apply a limit. All right, so we're gonna rearrange this which was cos theta minus one over theta. So we did all that algebra just to show cos theta minus one over theta is equal to that product on the right side. Now we're gonna take a limit on both sides. Limit theta approaches zero. Cos theta minus one over theta equals lim theta approaches zero, negative sine theta over theta times sine theta over cos theta plus So I use the quotient law for limits, or not quotient, the product law for limits. You can distribute your limit across a product. What was the condition on distributing your limit? So we'll run back to limit, limit laws. All right, here's where all the limit laws were. So our hypothesis was when both of your limits existed in the first place. Then you can split up your limit. So as long as your limits are individually or exist, you can split your limit up. Yeah. They they're not really, they should be pretty straightforward. They're not terribly complicated. It says as long as, basically as long as things are nice, as long as your limit of f and g exist, you can split up across the sum, product, difference, quotient, power, or constant. The only stipulation is your quotient can't be divided by zero, and your power has to be a real number, can't be imaginary. So there really wasn't anything to worry about with the product other than your two limits had to exist in the first place. And that's true for all of these laws here. So I just use the, as long as both of these limits exist, then it's okay to do what I did. If one of these is undefined, we're going to, I, these won't be equal anymore. So the good news is the left limit, what is the left limit here? 
I shouldn't use that word. What is that limit that I just zoomed into? It's a special limit. It means that it was 1. I didn't show why it was 1, but I did tell you that it was 1. So that's going to be 1. What about this limit over here? Let's try to just plug in 0 and see what we get. Maybe we'll get lucky. It should be a sine 0, not sine theta. Oh my goodness. Sine 0. OK. So what is sine 0? Zero. zero. <laughs> Sounded more short than anybody else. What is cosine zero? Zero. One. One. <laughs> All right, zero divided by two is zero. Yes. Times one is all zero. <laughs> all right, so we just show this limit is zero. Somewhere we started right there, so I'll just rewrite that limit down here. Lim x, nope, not x, theta, approach zero. So that's what we were trying to show. end of one-sided limits.